Space travel is life-enhancing, and anything that's life-enhancing is worth doing. It makes you want to live forever. Ray Bradbury Hello, dear friends. In today's video, we would like to tell you about space colonization and the challenges associated with it. Before we begin, we would like to ask you to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on new and exciting videos about space and the universe. Now, sit back and get comfortable as we get started. In science fiction novels and movies, authors have long described their ideal model of traveling across the galaxy. However, the serious issues surrounding space colonization in reality can only be truly understood by diving into extensive scientific articles on the subject. While attempting to comprehend why space colonization is so complex and explain its challenges, many scientists still hold firm in their belief that this event will inevitably occur sooner or later. Today, the key driving force behind realistic space colonization is Elon Musk. The world's richest person is determined to establish a self-sustaining colony in space and firmly believes that Mars is the only suitable candidate. The advantages of the fourth planet as a colonization target include the presence of water and nitrogen. Additionally, there is potential to raise the temperature to a level comparable to modern Earth. Yes, it will take centuries, but in the end, colonists will have 140 million square kilometers of habitable land covered in vegetation, roughly the same as on Earth. However, Musk's plans also come with colossal downsides. One word fills this gap. Biology. In 2016, an experiment on the Chinese satellite SJ-10 showed how space affects the development of mouse embryos. It went worse than on Earth, and the chances of survival for such embryos after transplantation to a female are slim. This issue isn't just about radiation, which can be shielded against, but also about gravity. Experiments in creating microgravity in Earth's laboratories have also demonstrated a deterioration in the parameters of mouse embryo. Perhaps this explains why rats have not been able to reproduce in space experiments. The gravity on Mars is only 38% of Earth's. While on one hand, this means you can easily jump several meters in length, it also adds significant complications to the reproduction of mammals. To counteract the negative effects of reduced gravity, many centrifuges are being tested in which people can sleep, compensating for the lack of gravitational force during the day. Their use allows for the prevention of muscle degradation and the associated osteoporosis, which are consequences of prolonged exposure to low gravity. But what if a couple plans to have children? For a healthy pregnancy, the pregnant woman needs to move normally and not be in a low-stimulus environment. It's unlikely that this can be provided in a centrifuge for nine consecutive months. Conclusion Mars colonization is currently incompatible with raising children there. And without children, any colony, especially a self-sustaining one, is doomed. Transporting women for conception and childbirth back to Earth would be time-consuming, expensive and challenging. Recently, Finnish researcher Pekka Janhunen proposed a completely different place for colonization instead of Mars. The orbit around the dwarf planet Ceres. The celestial body itself isn't a very promising candidate. It has a diameter of less than a thousand kilometers, gravity at 2.8% of Earth's, no atmosphere, and even sunlight is 7.8 times weaker there than in Earth's orbit. But what if we build O'Neill cylinders in its orbit? The concept of the O'Neill cylinder first appeared in 1976 Take two large cylinders of kilometer-sized dimensions and place them side by side. Giant magnetic field bearings are used at the connection points at both ends of the cylinders. Thanks to this, there is no friction and wear in the bearings. The bearing itself is needed to simplify the constant orientation of both cylinders toward the sun, otherwise their rotation will cause them to tumble. These cylinders need to rotate to create centrifugal force inside. In essence, such a cylinder is a gigantic centrifuge. The perceived gravity in the center of the cylinder will be zero, gradually increasing towards the edges, where it will become Earth-like near the walls. O'Neill cylinders are massive space colonies that require a large amount of water. It makes the most sense to store it in the outer walls, since water effectively shields against radiation. Some of it can be used for communal aquariums where exotic fish will swim. 
Thanks to the insulating outer layers, cosmic radiation inside the cylinders will be at the Earth's background level, and thanks to the rotation of the cylinders, Earth-like gravity will be created. Pepe Jan Hunen emphasizes that Kiri's low gravity in this scenario turns from a disadvantage into an advantage. On Earth, a space elevator, which means the lifting of materials along a cable, is unrealistic because it's impossible to create cables 36,000 kilometers, long capable of withstanding Earth's gravity. On Ceres, gravity is tens of times weaker and with minimal energy costs, an elevator can lift everything needed from its surface. As we know from recent research, Ceres has salts, plenty of nitrogen, a lot of water, and much more. Extracting metals from the main asteroid belt, where it is located, is not a problem at all, as many asteroids are metallic. At first glance, Jan Hunam proposes a cosmic paradise, a simple way to build an ideal extraterrestrial colony with minimal material and resource costs. But there are nuances, or rather two of them. Firstly, why not build an O'Neill cylinder in Earth's orbit? External protective cylinders are not needed here because the magnetosphere shields against radiation at low orbit. Concentrating sunlight with mirrors will not be required. To travel to Earth, it would take hours, not months, as it would when establishing a colony in Ceres orbit. Of course, there are no nearby asteroids with cheap materials, but the Moon is nearby, where gravity is six times weaker than Earth's, and there's at least a hundred billion tons of water ice. Developing systems like Starship will allow resources to be transported from Earth relatively inexpensively. The cylinders will be illuminated by the sun year-round, equally strong in any season. Therefore, they can obtain the necessary amount of energy from solar panels without the need for concentrator mirrors, as in the case of Ceres. Psychologically, it will be much easier for colonists to settle where they can see Earth and the Moon, and, potentially, they could travel to either of them relatively quickly. The second and more important question, what will people do inside the cylinder? Theoretically, in orbit around our planet at 450 kilometers, one could place 100 rows of 10,000 kilometer diameter cylinders, essentially creating a second Earth. There's a place to direct excess population. However, on Earth, there is no shortage of space or resources. Elon Musk rightfully points out that the biggest challenge for humanity in the 21st century will be a real and severe shortage of people for the economy, not an excess. So, why should we build these cylinders, perhaps to survive a possible planetary catastrophe? Well, cylinders in orbit would certainly survive any such event on our planet, but what would attract people there before such a catastrophe? Mass colonization won't happen in advance. In the case of colonizing Mars, the goals are clearer. First, there's a high probability of finding simple life there. The search for and study of this life, along with the exploration of Mars' extensive underground caves and its giant canyon systems, represents significant scientific objective. Finally, Mars could be terraformed on a horizon of centuries. It's a grand goal that gives meaning to the existence of a fairly large human colony. Nevertheless, we shouldn't dismiss the idea of these cylinders. Let's return to the colonization of Mars. Yes, future Martians shouldn't conceive and carry children in 0.38 Earth gravity. But what's stopping them and their partners from spending a few months in an orbital cylinder in a Mars-centric orbit before conception? They could give birth to a child there and then, decide whether to raise it in orbit or descend to the planet's surface. A hybrid of an orbital cylinder for childbirth and a planetary colony below could make Mars a truly sustainable, self-sustaining colony. Moreover, there will be no shortage of volunteers. On Mars, settlers will have an entire planet awaiting transformation, a return to the ancient state of a young, warm and wet Mars, which is so intriguing to planetologists. Cylinders have another useful feature. Launching research vessels to other objects in the solar system from Ceres to Titan will be much easier from them. After all, you won't need to overcome even Martian gravity to launch from a cylinder. Finally, the experience of long-term living in O'Neill cylinders could be valuable for interstellar flights over decades and centuries. Multi-kilometer-sized cylinders are ideal candidates for large colonization ships. 
In fact, Arthur Clarke depicted something similar in the novel Rendezvous with Rama. There, a cylinder measuring 16 by 50 kilometers along its walls has a freshwater sea with living inhabitants. Nothing prevents humans from creating such a colonization ship capable of flying for many centuries or even millennia. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. Please leave your comments suggesting topics you'd like us to cover in future videos. Thank you and see you next time.